everybody what is up it is cyborg elf here with another video after two years of radio silence i am back and i'm excited to bring you a new kernel development series so this is going to be the first episode and what our goal is is to use this for game hacking but a lot of the things that you learned from this series can be applied to a lot of other general concepts so in this first episode, my goal is to give you a firm foundation of what kernel development is and define a lot of the key terms associated with it, just so we have a firm foundation to build off in the rest of the series because these videos are going to be cumulative. Also, towards the end of the video, we're going to set up a kernel development environment that we're going to be using for the rest of the series. But before we do dive into everything, I want to touch on digital ethics really quick, especially since we are dealing with game hacking. There's three key considerations I want y'all to keep in mind. The first and one of the most important is permission. Always seek and make sure you have the necessary permission before attempting to modify or hack any systems. Also, be aware of the impact you're having. Recognize the implications of hacking especially how unethical hacking could lead to serious consequences such as system crashes, and always keep in mind legal boundaries. So you might or might not have heard of the word kernel before, and I just wanted to define it real quick. So a kernel is a softer, usually edible part of a nut, seed, or fruit. Okay, blah, blah, blah. This is an older definition. This doesn't really apply to us. But the second part is the kernel is the central or most important part of something. And how I'd like to think of it, it's kind of like the core of something. So here's a little example. The kernel is at the core of the popcorn. Tying this back into a more practical example, uh, the kernel right here is at the core of the operating system. So ring zero right in the core center. And don't worry, this diagram might look complicated, but again, I'll explain it more later. So what, what is a kernel? I've said the word kernel a lot so many times throughout this video. Well, a kernel is at the core, as we just said, and because it's at the core, it has complete control over everything in the system. And the kernel is gonna be responsible for system resources. And what it does is it acts as a bridge. So here's the hardware system resources, right? And then here's the software up here, so applications. And the hardware has to run through the kernel to get to the application, and the application has to run through the kernel to get to the hardware. So this is why the kernel acts as a bridge, enabling communication between the two. And that's really what makes the kernel so powerful. So where does this, the kernel, fit into the Windows operating system? Well, since Windows NT, the new technology release, which is basically Windows XP to all the way up to present day, Windows 11, Windows has utilized a hybrid kernel structure. And this is a little extra info, but it doesn't hurt to know. So a hybrid kernel structure combines a monolithic kernel with a microkernel. So touching on that, a monolithic kernel means one kernel. So an example of a monolithic kernel operating system could be Temple OS or the Linux operating system. And this is because the entire OS for them exists in kernel space. This is why a lot of Linux people will promote Linux because it has fast, uh, fast communication times between system hardware because you know the whole operating system exists within this kernel level. There's a lot less communication wait time. And then a microkernel, the second part of the Windows hybrid kernel, it enables basic communication. And this is uh, really, really good for offloading things like file systems and drivers to exist in the user space as their own processes. So this is really the second part that makes a hybrid kernel possible. And this is why Windows is unique among operating systems is because this hybrid kernel structure allows for optimized performance and it really just tries to take the best of both worlds between a monolithic kernel. So the next thing I want to touch on is what kernel mode is. So if we say we're in kernel mode, that's the most privileged operational state in Windows. And when we say privileged, we mean it has unrestricted access to all system resources, right? Because the kernel manages system resources. So if we're in a kernel mode, we should have unrestricted access to all hardware resources. And later, this is what we're going to expand upon because if we're in kernel mode, that means we can access memory pretty freely and this is where game hacking comes into play. So the third step I wanna to touch on is how the kernel facilitates interactions or operations. And this really just means that the kernel oversees kernel mode device drivers, executive services, device and process scheduling and memory management, and the hardware abstraction layer, HAL. So this simply means, you know, the kernel's at the core, it's gonna manage everything to make sure operations run smoothly. And this is kind of how uh, power gets delegated from the kernel to kernel mode drivers. 
Now the final point I want to touch on is how the kernel isolates non-priority user mode processes to ensure safety of the system. Now this might sound like a lot, but let's break it down. Safety of the system simply means that you don't want the system to crash like a blue screen of death that you might have seen before. And how it isolates it is different than how Linux isolates. So in Linux, everything is done on the kernel. So if a simple device driver fails, your system is more than likely gonna crash. Now Windows, because of this hybrid kernel structure and how you use kernel mode drivers, if a driver crashes, for the most part, you're not gonna get a blue screen of death. And that's really where the difference comes from. You might be used to the meme of how, you know, Linux always gets, or sorry, Windows always gets the blue screen of death, but there's a lot of potential uh, crashes that are avoided using this isolating in the hybrid kernel structure from Windows. So I started talking about drivers and I'm aware that some of you might not be too familiar with what a driver is. So let's touch on that briefly. Simply a driver is something that acts like a translator between a device or program and the operating system. So let's use a physical example. We have a keyboard, a mouse, and now this keyboard might be talking in a language that the operating system doesn't understand. So the operating system needs to have a device driver on it so it can understand what this is trying to tell this. So it simply acts as a translator. Now expanding on this, what is a kernel driver? Well, as mentioned a second ago, a kernel mode driver, also called a kernel driver for short, is a driver that operates at the same system privilege level as the kernel itself, right? The kernel kind of delegates its power to these kernel mode drivers. And in turn, the kernel just manages the drivers how they run. So again, it is worth noting a driver does not have to be a piece of hardware. It does not have to be assigned to a piece of hardware. There's some drivers that exist that are purely software based, but it's nice for a visual example to specify how a lot of hardware does require drivers. Before I was planning on doing the setting up the development environment as a separate video, but I didn't want to have to make you all wait another week, especially since for some of you, this might be kind of a beginner video. So we're gonna go ahead and do that now. For our virtual operating system environment, we're gonna be using VirtualBox, but there's a lot of other solutions out there like QEMU or VMware. But VirtualBox is one that I'm familiar with and happy with. So just head over to the website, the link will be in the description and you can hit the download button. And then also we're gonna be using a Windows 11 development environment. I'll have the link in the description for this too. And the nice thing about this is it's a Windows 11 operating system, but you can use it for free. So we'll download the VirtualBox version of that and let those both install. If you are confused about what virtualization is, or you just wanna learn more about it, check out the video I made in the description. Now that our two files are downloaded, go ahead and run the VirtualBox setup file and just click next through everything or read through it, whatever you want. Now we want to extract the zip file. So just right click, click extract all and select a location that works for you. Now, once we're in VirtualBox, we want to click on import and select the file of the OVA file we just extracted, and then it'll begin importing. And then once that's imported, click start and your virtual machine will begin to set up. Once that's set up, click machine settings, storage, click on the little disc icon and then select VirtualBox editions and click choose. Click OK, and you should get a notification shortly that the disk has been mounted. Go ahead and open up that disk file and run the setup.exe. We can click next through everything and let that install and click reboot now. What this does is it sets up allowing us to copy our clipboards and also drag and drop files into that virtual machine easily. To wrap up this video and briefly touch on other concepts that we're going to be going over later in this series, we got familiar with the basic understanding of what a kernel and a kernel driver are and how they function within an operating system. You also learned about kernel mode, where the kernel resides in the system's main memory, effectuating critical services for applications and system services. We took a deep dive into the Windows kernel next. We dived in deeper to understand the position of a kernel in the Windows OS, discussing how it employs a hybrid kernel model and the part it plays in both user mode and kernel mode processes. We unraveled the role of a driver and how a kernel driver significantly influenced the interaction between the kernel and hardware or software components. In this context, we outlined our upcoming goal of creating kernel driver that can read and write the memory of a video game as a part of the series goal. Next steps. 
Well, congratulations everyone. At this point, you should have a pretty firm grasp of the foundation of kernel development and how we will be using these principles to explore the world of game hacking. As we journey together through this series, every concept we learn will build on the previous one. This cumulative approach will reinforce your learning and mastery of kernel development within our unique context. By the end of this series, complex topics such as memory management, system calls, interrupt handling, kernel communication, and even building your own kernel driver for game hacking will become secondhand nature. Your understanding will be such that even the seemingly daunting will be done with relative ease. So buckle up and get excited. We're about to dive deep into the fascinating world of kernel development. Your participation, questions, and curiosity will drive this journey, making it a rewarding learning experience for all of us. Thank you for watching everyone. I'll see you in the next one.